text comes from the book of, of Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 4 to 7, just a couple of verses today. Joshua chapter 4, and we're looking at, at verses 4, 4 to 7, and it's on the screen. It says, so Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of, of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up a stone and carry it out on your shoulder, 12 stones in all, one for each of the 12 tribes of, of Israel. And so when you, we will use these stones to build a memorial in the future, your children will ask you, they'll ask you this question, what do these stones mean to you? And then verse 7 says, then you can tell them, they remind us that the, the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. And so I just want to just take some time. I know that our time is very far spent, but I want to take some time, if I can do that today, talking under the theme, remember the river. Turn to your neighbor and say, remember the river. <laughs> Come on, turn to your other neighbor and say, remember the river. I don't want, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. So God, we want to say thank you so, so much for bringing us here on your happy Sabbath, God, on this glorious Sabbath day. In fact, you told us to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so I pray that as we take some time this afternoon talking about remembering the river, that we can leave keeping this river and these situations on our hearts, knowing that we serve a great God. So let the words of my mouth and let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. And, and amen. And so the theme is remember, remember the river. And so the number 40 in, in the Bible has, it has a lot of significance. Um, so much so we'll see it from Genesis to Revelation where the significance can come in the form of testing and, and preparation. You see that number 40 is a period in, in times of the, the book of Genesis or in the book of Exodus where, where God had to test and prepare the children of Israel once they left Egypt. It's also significant that 40 means that Moses spent 40 days and he spent 40 nights in Mount Sinai as God was giving him the law of God. The number 40 also means purification and repentance. It's associated with periods of purification and repentance, and we see this in the Old Testament because there are seasons where the people, the children of Israel, are called to repent and turn back to God for personal growth, renewal, and to culminate sometimes the Day of Atonement. The number 40 is also a time of renewal and transformation. It can also symbolize transformation like how we saw in the time of Noah where it rained 40 days and 40 nights. It also means divine intervention and deliverance and we see that for 40 years the children of Israel they journey through the wilderness almost in circles so that God can intervene on their behalf. It also means a time of transition and wisdom. And in the Jewish culture, at the age of 40, a person transitions from one level of wisdom to the next. In fact, in the book of Exodus, we see that Moses led the Jewish people. He led them for 40 years in the wilderness. And there came a time in his life, 40 more years, where he had to pass the baton to Joshua. 
But I want to land here because this is really the, 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 the reason why we're here today, because there is a transition in generation. And so every 40 years, it's spoken in, in the time of the Bible, we see that there are generations that renew and, and transitions in generations. And once we hit 40, another generation is coming. God is moving us from one state to another, one place to another, in the normal use of the number 40 in Scripture. You see, the number 40, it also represents a time in Israel's life when they were journeying through the wilderness. This, this was a time where they learned about faith. They learned about God's power. They learned and trained their appetite to wait upon the Lord that for, seven, for six days the Lord will rain manna from heaven and they learned how to store up and to save because they knew that on the seventh day manna would not fall. So they learned discipline. For 40 years in the wilderness, they learned to be creatures of habit and, and they learned to, to um, be um, humbled because they recognized that they were talking from the side of their neck, journeying through the, the Red Sea when they would tell God, we should have just gone back to Egypt. We should have gone back to Egypt. We don't see what you're about to do, God. So take us back to slavery. And so God had to humble them and remind them that I'm taking you to places you have not seen, things that you've heard of. I'm about to make them real for your life in this generation. So in the text, now it was the time for them to cross over. It was time for them to transition because they've reached their 40th year. This was a miracle. It was a crossover for a lifetime. The reality is, what you have to understand is that as they have gone through the wilderness experience, they're meeting themselves at another crossroad. This crossroad, this time, is that you have to understand that they have to cross the Jordan River. And when they're about to cross the Jordan River, they're about to cross it in flood season. And if there's any a time we don't want to cross the Jordan River, we don't want to cross the Jordan River in flood season. That's like setting up a wedding down here in South Florida in, in hurricane season. These are just some things we don't do because there is an unpredictability of storms that could come that can ruin the wedding plans. And so it's not in flood season That's because it's the most dangerous season of the year. You see, this is a time where they would most likely run into problems. This is a time where they would most likely drown. This is a time where their human capacity is at its lowest. But I'm here today to remind us that God does some of his greatest work in flood season. <laughs> God does some of his greatest work in flood season. If we go back to Genesis, although it was a tragic situation, God renewed the world through flood season. If we remember what God was doing, he, he had to reset the world because the Bible says sin was so great. It reached, the, it reached the throne room of heaven, and God said, I'm going to have to hit the reset button on my planet. Let me make this plain for someone today. Flood season is when the waters of our life is too high. When the problems are too great, the needs are overwhelming, the rapids are rolling, when the waters are too deep for us to get a firm footing. In other words, when the situation is beyond us, it's above us, it's where God makes it hard, where he has to get the glory through us. It's flood season, where God leaves his mark through his miracles. It was no different in the book of Exodus. We remember the story when they were crossing the Red Sea and there is no way out unless God shows up and does something supernatural. Imagine Moses during that time 
He's looking like a chicken with his head cut off. They're asking Moses, we're leaving Egypt and you bring us to this point for us to have nowhere to go. And imagine this, these are a new generation of Israelites that were not there when Jesus parted or when God parted the Red Sea. So imagine all of the questions that, that were coming up in their minds. And, and if you happen to be in, in flood season, if you happen to be in a season where you are overwhelmed, when you happen to be in a season when the problems continue to stack up, if you happen to be in a season where you feel as though there's no way out, where the circumstances don't seem like it's going to get good, I, I dare to say that you're in good hands because God does some of his best work in flood season. So God told them, told Joshua to instruct the priests. These are the spiritual leaders. I need you to tell them just to step out on a little faith. Someone say little faith. <laughs> and he just needed them to step out on a little faith because we recognize that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things unseen. And in the Bible, Jesus preached about if we had faith as small as a mustard. And the point of the matter is God is saying, I don't care if it's big faith or little faith. I just need you to trust me. So he says, I just need you to tell them to tap their foot in the water. Just put a little toe in. <laughs> it's like going to Miami Beach or Hallover Beach or Hollywood Beach, and we know that the water is cold, and we just got to put a little touch in for our bodies to acclimate to the water so we can get used to what our body is about to endure. And God says, just put a little toe in the water and watch me work. And so we ask ourselves, why? <laughs> why would God allow these people to go through hoops just to prove that he is God? And so before we can ever see what God does, he wants us to step out on faith. He wants us to walk out on faith, to believe that he is qualified to do what he says he will do. It's not that God has to prove to us that he's God, because he is God. But for our human minds, it's hard to grasp that God can call an earth into existence by just a word. <laughs> that he can set the sun, moon, and stars in place by just a word. The Bible says that in the book of Exodus, that by the blast of his nostrils, <laughs> he can part a Red Sea. And this was more about their faith development more than anything. And so the priest, they put their foot in the waters and, and, and he's like, I want to see if you're going to trust me. So shortly after, we see a couple of miracles that take place as a result of their faith. And, and we see that in the text, the Bible says that, that God blocked the water. He cut off the water on either side. They crossed not on wetland. They didn't cross where the land was mushy and gushy. The Bible says that they crossed on dry land. Let me paint this picture for you just a little bit. Imagine the people of Israel, the children of Israel, crossing through this, this now highway in, in the desert. Imagine them crossing and they have their wagons getting stuck in, in the mud. <laughs> Imagine they're, they're crossing, and, and these are thousands of people. Imagine them crossing, and they're slipping and sliding as they're crossing into the promised land. And God is saying, whenever I'm here to, to part any sea of your life, whenever I'm here to take you from one desert and into your promise, it's always going to be on solid ground. It's going to be on solid ground. So all of this happens in what? Flood what? Flood season. So in this context, God asks Joshua to get, get representatives. He says, Joshua, I don't care who they are, but get me 12 men to carry stones on their shoulders so that it can be stones to build me a memorial. 
You know why God is doing this? Because he wants them to never forget what he has done here and who did it. The only way you, you got from here is because of me and not because of your own resources. In other words, I don't want you to say that my mom did it. <laughs> I don't want you to say that the teacher did it. I don't want you to say that chat GPT did it. Come on and say amen. <laughs> I don't want you to say that Quizlet did it. I don't want you to say that the principal helped me do it or the doctor did it or the police officer did it. I don't want you to give any credit but to me. Because oftentimes we start to get big-headed. <laughs> We start to start smelling ourselves, start to feel ourselves. We begin to walk a little different when we get that new car with the new car smell. When we get them keys to that new house, we begin to get all bougie and, and, and tell people, don't sit on that couch. Make sure you sit at that table. We begin to smell ourselves. But God is saying, don't, don't begin to smell yourself because allow these stones to be a perpetual reminder that the only reason, I want you to get this, the only reason that we are here today is not by our strength, it's not by our might. The Bible says it's because of God's power. It's because of his supernatural intervention. It's because he had to come from his throne room of heaven to intervene on the affairs of earth. So why build a memorial? <laughs> out of all things they could have built next to the Jordan River, out of all things, God, why would you have these people build a memorial? The reason why he would have us build a, a memorial is because as humans, we are subject to forget. I have a four-year-old niece, and I love my niece as if she were my own child. <laughs> but as she continues to grow and develop, I have to remind myself that this little one, she quickly forgets. And so I remember there was a time when she was riding. Um, I had a Tesla at the time, and, and I told her, I said, Kelly, make sure you don't touch the, the panel of the door with your sticky, greasy Chick-fil-A hands. Because auntie got to clean that up. <laughs> and by the time we got out of the car, I see handprints on the glass, sticky, greasy hands on the panels of the car. And I asked her, Kelly, what happened? She says, Tita, I forgot. <laughs> and of course, I loved on her and just reminded her when we're in the car, we make sure we keep it nice and clean. But as humans, we forget. Sometimes we commit to do things, and, and although we have good intentions, life gets in the way, and we simply forget. Children have forgotten their parents, what do I mean? They have forgotten some of the trainings that their parents have instilled to them since they were young. Sometimes as college students, we forget the investments the elders and our parents have invested within us. We have forgotten the hard work and the effort that goes into training up children in the way they should go. And when they get older, they shall not depart from it. We're in a generation of children that have forgotten. And God knows, God knows that we are prone for, to forget. And so he says, so that we may not forget, build me a memorial. Because out of all of the things that we have in this world, you can forget a name. I'm notorious for doing that. I'll call a student's name different and I will have to ask for forgiveness. We can forget a name, we'll forget a number, we'll forget how people did us wrong. There are many things that we should forget, but one thing in our life we shall never forget is who God is. And so when we look at the Bible, there are many times in the Bible where it instructs us, it admonishes us to remember. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 12.1, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. 
while the evil days come, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. In the book of Proverbs, verses 1 to 8, it says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace or your head and a chain to adore your neck. Parents are telling their children, do not forget. Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 says, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and to your generation. Verse 10 says, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a large and beautiful cities which you did not build. If you go to Deuteronomy 8 verses 11, it says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt from the house of bondage. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. And he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. So the Bible is reminding us that we better not forget. It's easy to forget because... When we think about us being the main source or we look at ourselves as if we are the ones that are the ones who are powerful or the ones who are the ones who got us out of these situations, God reminds us to not forget. And God quickly humbles us. God quickly reminds us. I remember when you were staying in Liberty City. <laughs> and now you didn't move a couple zip codes to Miami Gardens. I remember when you had a Metro Day bus pass and you was on the 77 bus stop. You was on the Metro Rail trying to get to Sunrise Shopping Plaza. But I bless you with some wheels to get you up the road. God is saying, I remember when you were single and you was ready to mingle. And now you have a family and you've forgotten all about me. God is saying, I remember when I healed your sin sick body. I told you to go and sin no more, and you find yourself in these entanglements that continue to get us in these troubles. And God is saying, remember, remember me. The reminder is if God opened the door, if God paved the way, if he set the place up for us to live in abundance, if God was not the source, it's easy to forget. He goes on to say in, in Deuteronomy that, that he wants us to never forget because he's setting, up, setting us up in places, sometimes in situations that we don't even have to work for. <laughs> Anyone ever, anyone ever been in a situation where you just walked into a great job because someone quit their job and they set it up just enough for you to excel at your job? <laughs> no one ever been in that situation? Or anyone ever been in a situation where God has blessed us, where we didn't have to work for, for the car that we have, or we didn't have to work for the home that we've gotten in because guess what? It was a part of the signing bonus to get the job. You sign on the dotted line, the check is enough to put on the opening of that home. And God is telling the children of Israel, I'm blessing you. I'm taking you into this land of promise where you don't have to work. You don't have to build. You don't have to construct. You don't have to wrestle for property because it's all going to be handed over to you. But just remember, don't think that you did this on your own. Don't forget that God is the source. Don't forget that God is the hand that provided. 
And God is saying and reminding us that he's been present with us each and every time. And he's saying that if I kept you in the midst of the wilderness, I'll be with you going through, the, through this river. And I'll be with you once you get into the promised land. If we're going to be honest in church, if we're going to be very honest today, where would we be if it weren't for God's grace? Where would we be if God's protective hand weren't upon us? If God didn't stop that drunken driver from speeding past us on the express lane on 95? Where would we be if God wasn't intervening in some of the meetings that that were calling us to be fired? Come on, we know we come to late to work. (laughs) But where would we be if the mercy in the hand of God didn't carry these selfish, ungrateful people through the wilderness? If God wasn't their manna, their bread of life every single day. The Bible says that he was a pillar of cloud by day and he was fire by night. Where would we be if God didn't send his angels to watch over us through the night, if God didn't protect us, if God didn't deliver us, if God didn't make a way out of no way, we wouldn't be here to tell the story. Because God oversees in his counsel over every affair in this world. He preserves us, he walks with us, and he wants to remind us, do not forget So he says, build me a memorial so that the people of God can remember my goodness. I am the source. I don't want you to have any other source to think that they've helped you and aided you and where you are today. I'm the only one to demonstrate my glory. And so he sends them to gather stones. The stones are very significant in our story because it's the stones where many, many children in their day would ask questions. And the Bible sets this up so perfectly because he says that I never want this generation to remember, but when you're dead and gone, the stones will be here forever. And your children will ask a very important question, what do these stones mean? What do they mean? Why would you all erect stones on the side of a river? What do these stones mean? And I can imagine one of the elders pulling one of the children aside and saying, these stones mean that all of us men had to circumcise ourselves before entering into this promised land. It meant that we had to purify our hearts, purify our spirits. That's what these stones mean. I can imagine them saying that the stones mean that we had to celebrate Passover. We had to celebrate what God is to us, the covenant of grace. And how many of us have children that are asking us, what does our faith mean? You see, during this season of transition, God knew in his wisdom that the faith of their fathers was being transformed. But the reality is we are in a chaotic world right now where there is not a, we're living in a world where there is a transfer problem. I'll say that again. We're living in a chaotic world where there is a transfer problem where many of us are not answering those questions of what do these stones mean? The Bible says in in Judges, Judges chapter 2, verse 10, Judges chapter 2, verse 10, very quickly, it says, when all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. So you mean to tell me we're living in a generation today? where our children don't know the Lord. (laughs) Our children are not being schooled at Adventist education. Our children are barely coming into Sabbath school. Our children aren't sitting under family worship. 
Our children are not respectful in honoring their father and their mother that their days may be long upon the earth. We're living in days like this. The Bible says it. The Bible sets it up for us that we're living in a time that our children should be asking us as elders. My niece should be asking, Tita, why are we going to church? (laughs) Why are we worshiping on the Sabbath? Who is God? Why don't we pray to Jesus? And the Bible declares that in this season that there has been a problem with the transfer of our faith. Parents have been entrusted to answer questions. God has put this responsibility not on children. (laughs) Not on just the pastors. Notice it didn't say he gathered the priests. Many people say, well, we need the pastor. No, 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 no. You're the priest of your home. You have just as much access as I have to God than anyone else. And God was very strategic in saying, I don't want this responsibility to just fall on the priest, but I want it to fall on the men of the home, the family, to be responsible for how the story is told. Twelve different perspectives. So somebody's going to say, you know what, God was man to me. <laughs> but it's always going to end at God. God was the pillar of fire for me. It's always going to end with God. God was a bridge over troubled waters for me. It's going to end with God. God was a way maker for me. It's going to end with God. God was a healer for me. It's going to end with God. Children are going to ask, well, mom, dad, how are you so blessed? Because God saw me through my wilderness. (laughs) And sometimes the problems that I have with with us older generation, we don't like to talk about our wilderness. We don't want to talk about what God has brought us through. And so we set up the young children for failure when we see them stumble and fall with drugs. They stumble and fall with not knowing their identity, who they are. They don't have to fly to Dominican Republic to get a BBL. No, you are loved by God. There's a lot of people who don't know who they are and who and who made them. And so there's just a lot of confusion and chaos in this world. And God is saying, because you didn't tell them about the river, (laughs) because you didn't tell them about the, the wilderness, you didn't tell them about how you came over. You didn't tell them about how you had some moms and grandmas that were faithless? Come on. Grandmama was faithless. That's why she's not here today. That's why God didn't allow them to live and to see this promise because the spies came back and they didn't trust in the name of the Lord. And God is saying, I need you. Tell them about the wilderness. I believe someone needs to go home and and have that come to Jesus moment and tell them about how you overcame addiction. It's hard. That's why there's some counselors out there, some therapists that can guide you through that process. But our children aren't asking because we're not telling them. And so we wonder. We wonder why that kid in the store won't listen to his mom. We wonder why our children go into their rooms and don't want to have any conversations with us. We wonder when every time the parents call on Sabbath, do not disturb. Because the story of salvation, the story of how we've overcome. And God is saying, you all will forget. 
But I want you to remember, remember the wilderness. Remember where I brought you from. Remember those days when you had nothing. Remember those days when you didn't, weren't able to get a job. When they didn't accept you the first time, but it was on the second go, I opened the door. Remember me. But remember the river. Because it was the river that you crossed over from your old way of life. God is so good. He says the former things will have passed away. He says the wilderness won't mean a thing because you're crossing over and I'm making all things new. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but some of us have forgotten. We've forgotten where God has brought us from. We've forgotten our way. And so much so, it's been so bad that now we're responsible for how we've allowed our children to not even know the Lord. Because we're seeing this generation today, some of them don't know their Bible text. They don't even know the miracles of Jesus. They don't even know the soul-saving work of salvation because we're not sharing what God has done for us. The song says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, seeking very deep within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters, lifted me, now safe enough am I. Love lifted me. So I'm talking to someone that wants to remember the river. You want to remember where God has brought you from. Some of us may not even be in Egypt, um, in wilderness. We may still be stuck in Egypt. <laughs> but God is like, I want to take you to these stages. We want promised land, but we don't want to go through wilderness. We want promised land, but we don't want to go through the, 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 the river. We want promised land. But we don't want to tell the story. And God is like, I want you to tell the story. But get over, cross over, and remember me. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to invite you to pray with me. And so God of heaven, we say thank you. We say thank you because you brought us out of some stuff. You brought us out of some scandalous stuff. <laughs> that if it were to hit WSBN, the whole church would be shook. But we thank you for your mercy. <laughs> we thank you for your grace. We thank you for being a forgiving God that's patient with us, slow to anger, abundant in love and mercy. But God, many of us are challenged today, maybe hurt a little, that we haven't done our job. We haven't told the next generation about the stones. And that's on us. Maybe we don't know the words, God. Maybe we don't know the story ourselves, but help us to get to know the story. There's a child in this room that needs to be saved because of the stones, because of the memorial. And those stones bring shame to think about what we used to be. But there's no shame in the sight of God. The Bible declares, whom the Son sets free, they are free indeed. And so remove shame, remove the spirit of silence from the room. And 
Help us to walk proudly sharing that I once was a liar. <laughs> I once was a thief. I once was a gossip. I once was a cheater. I once was a cursing sailor. <laughs> I've done some unethical things, but you allowed me to cross over into the new way of life. Because we're new in you, God. We're no longer bound by the sin that so easily besets us. But we're set free. So I speak and pray a word of freedom in the room today. I pray a, a word of breakthrough in the room today. I pray a word that someone will cross over from their wilderness on solid ground, not sinking sand into their promised land in the room today. And Lord, I pray this last prayer, help us to remember that when we're down and out, when there's no way out, you brought us from it before, and you'll do it again. We thank you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.